Hi everybody, my name is Curtis Mitch and I'm with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And welcome back to another weekday reflection on today's Mass readings. Today is Monday, June 7th, and we're looking today at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And by the way, I just want to say, if you feel like these reflections are helpful to you, they're encouraging you to grow in your faith and that sort of thing, please help us um, as well by clicking the subscribe button below along with the notification bell. And that way you'll know every time these reflections are completed and posted. Now, today's gospel, as I say, is from Matthew 5, 1 to 12. And this is the account of the Beatitudes where Jesus gives us that famous beginning to his sermon. It's really, in a sense, the majestic entrance into Jesus' most famous sermon, and that's the Sermon on the Mount, the sermon that appears in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. All right, now I have this memory of back when I was in elementary school at St. Mary's of the Assumption. You know, when we were learning about the Beatitudes, we were told that Jesus is telling us what our attitude should be. And while that might seem like a kind of childish, you know, a simplistic way of putting it, in a sense, it's really not that far off the mark because Jesus is giving us here a roadmap of the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is a rich theme in this first gospel of the New Testament. It, it's multidimensional, you might say. I actually like to think of the kingdom of heaven as having something like three dimensions. The three E's of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew's gospel are there's an ethical dimension, there's an ecclesial dimension, and there's an eschatological dimension. The ethical dimension of the kingdom of heaven is, is what it looks like for me and you to live according to the gospel that Jesus preaches to us, all right? It's a way of living the values of the kingdom, of, of living in, in the direction of the kingdom, you might say. But then there's that ecclesial dimension as well, that we're not just lone ranger Christians, we're part of a community, and Jesus calls us to live together in community, in communion with one another, and in communion with the church. And so the kingdom of God is manifest among the people of God, and not just in the life of each individual disciple. All right, and then there's that eschatological dimension. All right, what the future will bring. The kingdom of God is hidden now, and it is growing now, but it, in the end, it will be fully manifest before our very eyes. And I think you really have all three dimensions of the kingdom of heaven. The ethical, the ecclesial, and the eschatological are all kind of unfolded. They all present themselves to us in, these tight, in this tight cluster of verses in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, all right? So let's read the text, and let's just try to get into it a little bit. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right. So what's going on here? We've got these famous eight beatitudes. But first, we should probably answer the question, what is a beatitude, right? Right? A beatitude actually comes from the Latin word beatitudo, which means blessedness or blissful happiness, you know, something along those lines. And you'll notice that every, uh, every beatitude 
kind of has these two panels that are hinged together. It's a two-part thing, right? You have a proclamation or a pronouncement, and then you have a promise that is made if that condition is fulfilled. So the pronouncement in all of them is the same. Blessed or, or makarioi is how the Greek has it. It's a reference to, it's almost equivalent to, I guess you could say, of how fortunate you are. What advantageous circumstances you enjoy to be on the road to the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, because we don't believe in fortune, we believe in the providence of God, it's preferable to say blessed are those people because God has placed you in those circumstances. God has made you, you know, set you on the road to his kingdom. And then each one comes with that promise. And that promise is something that is projected into the future. Right? It's something connected with eternal life, connected with the last judgment, connected with those things that we will experience when we finally arrive at the end of our lives and at the end of human history, when Jesus judges the world and takes the saints to their eternal inheritance. Now, it's at least interesting to point out that Jesus did not invent this literary form of Beatitudes. This is actually something that comes from the Old Testament. You'll see it in the book of Psalms, right? The very first verse of the book of Psalms, right? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, all right? That's a macarism, a beatitude, as it were, all right? And then it goes on to speak about the different destiny of the righteous and the wicked. So you have that future promissory element in Psalm 1 as well. And then you also find a number of beatitudes in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament as well. So Jesus is speaking very much within the tradition of Israel, within the religious and biblical traditions of Israel. So what are the Beatitudes then? I just want to take a brisk walk through each one of the eight Beatitudes and just try and get a sense of what Jesus is saying. So the first thing he says is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor in spirit? Well, if you read our tradition, if you read biblical commentaries written by the saints and the fathers of the church, you often find that the poor in spirit are equated with the humble in spirit, all right? Uh, these are the people that are humble in their relationship to God in particular. They're not necessarily impoverished economically, although they can be, right? The book of James says that it's the poor of the world that God has chosen to make rich in faith, right? So there, there is a pattern there. But Jesus is talking about poor in spirit, and that in spirit is a meaningful addition, okay? Because the poor in spirit, or to have spiritual poverty, is to be acutely aware of one's needs in the spiritual life. It's to be aware that when it comes to fulfilling God's will, when it comes to, to living out the vocation that God has given to me, I don't have the natural resources to do that. I can't glorify him and fulfill his calling in my life unless I have his help. So the poor in spirit recognize the poverty of grace that is in their life, and so they rely upon God. They call upon God, and they're constantly asking God for his help in their life. That's the poor in spirit. Then we have blessed are those who mourn. Now, there's nothing particularly blessed about crying or lamenting or mourning and, you know, experiencing sadness. The point here is that those who mourn are those who lament the evils of the world, those who lament sin. That's the way St. Augustine describes it, for example. All right. And so we lament the evil that is in the world because it's contrary to God's will. We lament the evil that is in the church because that is contrary to God's will. But most of all, we lament the sin that is in our own life. We know those vices. We know our weaknesses and we know our history. And we are, we are deeply grieved by the fact that we have grieved Almighty God in making those choices. So those who mourn are those who are repentant, you might say. The third beatitude is blessed are the meek. And who are the meek? The meek are the patient and the long-suffering. All right, we sometimes equate 
meekness, at least in a popular context, meekness with weakness. But it's actually just the opposite. Meekness is a form of strength. It's a form of inner strength by which we restrain the passion of anger even when we're provoked. All right. And so meekness is sometimes translated gentleness. It's someone who's who's got their their temper, their anger under control, even when they're living in difficult circumstances and they're provoked by others. So it's not a weakness. It's a strength. It's a deep inner strength to be meek. The fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are the people, I think this is the way that Jesus is describing that the saints have spiritual priorities. All right, there are lots of things that are worth pursuing in life. Some are natural goods. The others are supernatural, in which case they're superior, they're better. All right, so it's not wrong to desire to hunger and thirst for food and drink. Of course not. Those are basic needs that we have. But those who hunger and thirst for righteousness desire something uh, something greater. They desire a higher and better gift from God. All right, Jesus, I think, will get at this later on in the Sermon on the Mount when he, when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things, all your basic needs will be supplied as well. But you want, you got to have your priorities. What is most important in life? That's your relationship with God. And that's all that you need to live as a child of God. The fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful. Jesus, you know, this is a pretty straightforward one. Jesus is calling those who would, who would enter the kingdom of heaven for all of eternity to be generous with forgiveness. All right. We might think also of the works of mercy. There are corporal works of mercy, like feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, burying the dead, those kinds of things, as well as spiritual works of mercy. Okay. So these are the types that Jesus, this is the way of life that Jesus is calling us to. And then number six, blessed are the pure in heart. Well, who are the pure in heart? What is purity of heart? On the one hand, purity of heart seems to be a single-mindedness. It means having an undivided heart a heart that is consecrated to God, a, a heart that desires God's will, and it's not torn by the things of the world. So again, later on in the sermon, Jesus will say you cannot serve both God and mammon, right? That's a divided heart. That's a divided commitment. And Jesus wants a singleness of purpose from each one of us, from each one of his disciples. But we could also say that if it's, if it's not a divided heart, it's also not a defiled heart. Because again, just a few verses later on in the same chapter, Jesus will talk about committing adultery in the heart. That one commits adultery not just by performing the act with another person's spouse, but, but even on the inside, even in your thoughts, your, your desires. You can lust after someone and commit adultery in your heart. And so the pure of heart are those who fight against those urgings of our lower nature right? Those base desires that we sometimes had. And I really like this one, uh, this beatitude number eight, the pure in heart, because, because of the promise that Jesus attaches, all right? For they shall see God. That is the, the one-line definition of what heaven is all about. We in our Catholic tradition refer to that as the beatific vision, that ultimately what it means to go to heaven, as it were, we think of it in spatial terms, what it means is that we will see the living God in all of his glory without mediation whatsoever. We will stand before him and we will see him. That is the ultimate definition of what the kingdom of heaven is about. The seventh beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers. The peacemakers are those who want to see relationships healed, all right? I don't mean just, you know, they're, they're, they're diplomatic and they try to get people to be friends and they're bit bridge builders and things like that. That's certainly true. But if you read the saints, they will say that some of the greatest peacemakers in the world are evangelists and missionaries. 
because ultimately what the peacemaker wants is they want God to be reconciled to the sinners of the world. That's the relationship that's most important. And so that's where we want to have peace. When we when we come to God, come to faith in Jesus Christ and receive that forgiveness of sins, then we have peace with God, that peace that surpasses all, understa- uh, all understanding, according to St. Paul. And then finally, the eighth beatitude. Blessed are the persecuted, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. This is the, this is the one, uh, you know, in a sense, all the beatitudes are embodied in Jesus. But this one is particularly conspicuous when you think about the life of Christ, all right, that he was hated and rejected and slandered and abused and ultimately put to death. And Jesus is saying, if you will enter the kingdom of heaven, then you will walk the path that I have walked. You too will be, you too will face the opposition of the world and the malice of those who want to stamp out my message um, and my people. So those are the Beatitudes, and I call them the, 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 the grand entrance into the Sermon on the Mount because they really touch upon a number of themes that will be developed later on in the sermon. This whole sermon kind of hangs together very tightly. And it's, uh, it's a really encouraging thing to read as Christians. If there's one part of the Bible that I would recommend that you, that you memorize, it would be the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with these first 12 verses, the Beatitudes. Well, thank you very much for tuning in uh, uh, to be with us here today. I pray that God blesses you, your family, and your day. And I look forward to seeing you here again next time.